Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Before we get started, I just want to let you know a couple of things. You are automatically muted when you join this call, and we are recording this presentation and plan to post it on our YouTube channel in the near future. Dajia hao. Welcome to our China chat. Um, I'm Mara Youngren brown a volunteer with the Northwest China Council. Helping coordinate and produce this event tonight is John Wong, our executive director. The Northwest China Council is an educational nonprofit based in Portland, Oregon, founded in 1980 from a grant from the Asia Society in New York to promote greater cultural understanding between the U.S. and China. We offer Mandarin Chinese lessons online, China chats, and other events as well. To learn more about our organization and to keep track of events we sponsor or are involved with, visit us on the web at nwchina.org. You can also find links to register for future China chats, and you can view recordings of previous China chats on our website. Before I introduce tonight's guest, I want to emphasize that this event will be interactive. During the Q&A portion of this event, we would love for you, the audience, to participate. If you would like to ask our guest a question during our Q&A, please do so by entering it in the Q&A function of Zoom. We will close our event today with a few words from President Jim Mockford, and with that, I am very happy to introduce tonight's speaker. We are very pleased to welcome Eugene Marlowe. Eugene Marlowe is an award-winning composer, producer, author, and professor at Baruch College, City University of New York. Since 1988, Dr. Marlowe has taught courses in media and culture, and he is the senior professor of the Department of Journalism and the Writing Profession. Dr. Marlowe has published 13 books and his latest, Jazz in China, from dance hall music to individual freedom of expression, endeavors to answer the question, is there jazz in China? It is our pleasure to host this chat with you tonight. And with that, you have the floor, Dr. Marlow. Thank you very much, Mara. That's a, a wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, first thing I want to do is to thank the folks at the uh, Northwest China Council for inviting me to uh, be part of this uh, presentation and to uh, meet you all and uh, please get your questions uh, on the ready because I much prefer to do a, a Q&A than uh, a, a long lecture, which is uh, boring for me and probably boring for the audience as well. That said, there are, whether you've read the book or not, or read half the book or you know, parts of the book, um, there are three takeaways uh, that I'd like you uh, to, to consider uh, from uh, the book and uh, the the documentary as, uh, as well. Perhaps you know that I, I, I uh, um, completed a documentary uh, last year, 19, in 19, uh, 2022, uh, based on the book. But let's, let's talk about the book. The first thing is China, as maybe uh, most of you uh, know, has a very long history of adherence to central authority. Uh, whether it's the, uh, the the emperor, the dictator, or the party, and it, it's it was a surprise to me uh, when I started to research uh, uh, this subject in the 2000 uh, that jazz uh, has not only survived for the last hundred years in China; it's actually grown uh, quite a bit. Uh, jazz, uh, if I can offer this this definition, jazz is a very democratic form of music because of the element of improvisation, which allows the soloist to make a personal uh, expression, an individual expression. And that's what makes it uh, a very democratic form of music. So it's kind of a, a, an ironic uh, and anti-intuitive -intuit um, juxtaposition that jazz as a democratic form of music has uh, not only survived, but grown in China in the last hundred years. So th that's the first thing. And by the way, um, is the, the jazz as a, a, an element of a culture in, like China is, is not a singular event. Uh, you can find uh, jazz uh, in all sorts of other places where the uh, government is authoritarian, but I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get into that uh, later during the Q&A. So that's number one. The second uh, takeaway is the influence of African American jazz musicians. This is this is quite clear. Uh, in the twenties and the thirties, uh, numerous uh, African American jazz musicians uh, essentially left the United States 
uh, because of uh, racial discrimination there and found um, home uh, for their music in other parts of the world, not only in Europe like France, but in places like uh, uh, Japan, the Philippines, and uh, and China, um, the, several. And they had a, a great influence uh, on the um, musicians, the Chinese musicians uh, at the time, especially in Shanghai. Um, and moving you know, forward to the, the, the middle of the 20th century, uh, particularly after uh, Mao died in 1976 and China began to open up uh, to the West. The very first jazz musician to perform from uh, a country outside uh, the, uh, the United uh, the, uh, outside of China uh, to come to China to perform was a guy named really, Willie Ruff. Uh, he taught for many years at Yale. He's a bass player and a horn player. And he was the very first jazz musician uh, to uh, perform uh, in China, in Shanghai, at the Conservatory of uh, Shanghai uh, after Mao uh, died. And based on uh, the interviews that I did with uh, several jazz musicians uh, in various parts of China for my documentary, it became increasingly clear uh, that most of their influences, the, the jazz musicians that uh, inspired them were again, African-American jazz musicians. So that's a very clear uh, aspect of the story of jazz in China. So that's number two. And number three is the influence of technology. Uh, there's a long history here. <laughs> you have to really go back to the opening of the Suez Canal in the middle of the 19th century. What that did, if you know, if you know the, the geography, is that it lopped off uh, almost 3,000 miles in terms of a journey of getting to Europe, to China to do trade. So that uh, clearly uh, opened up uh, China for, uh, for more uh, uh, trade. And it's especially the steamship that was the influence here. But if you get into the early part of the 20th century, the 1910s and the, and the 1920s and 30s, uh, the record uh, the 78s flooded uh, China, as did uh, sheet music coming on, coming to China uh, on these uh, steamships. Um, and in Shanghai, there was actually an RCA Victor uh, Shanghai uh, company creating all of these uh, uh, records, uh, mostly uh, of um, uh, European and African uh, and uh, American uh, musicians, but it was pop music uh, as well. So that technology had a major influence. Early radio had an early influence. Early film uh, had an, uh, uh, an influence because very often the, um, the, the tracks, the audio tracks in these films had a jazz or pop, a pop um, uh, a tinge uh, to them. Then you get to the middle of the 20th century and um, lo and behold, we have the jet plane, uh, which was developed not only in England, but also in Germany during World War II. So the jet plane uh, sped up the, uh, the transportation at the time to get from Europe or the United States uh, to uh, China. And then going even uh, closer to our time, then you have the audio cassette and then the CD, and then the DVD, and then of course the internet. And collectively, all of these technologies um, influenced uh, the uh, survivability and the expansion of uh, jazz uh, in China, where it is expanding even uh, today. There are more colleges and universities offering courses in jazz all over uh, China, but particularly in Beijing and Shanghai. Um, and there are more what they call jazz bars uh, in uh, China, mostly in the, the, the big cities and the medium-sized cities. You won't find it uh, at all, if, if at all, uh, in the, uh, the countryside. Anyway, those are the three uh, the takeaways, uh, the sort of the, the political aspects, uh, the government um, aspects, the African-American influence, 
uh, African American jazz musician influence, and uh, and the advent of technology of all kinds that has uh, influenced uh, the the advent of jazz in China. Anyway, that's the formal part of my presentation, and I'm I'm uh, really ready to uh, hear some uh, some questions. And with that, I'm going to echo Dr. Marlowe. Feel free to let the questions flow in. But to kind of kick us off, I'm just going to start by asking one of my own. Um, so I know you spent a lot of time in Beijing and you spent a lot of time in Shanghai. And so I'm curious to know, how would you characterize the differences or similarities between the jazz scene in Beijing and the jazz scene in Shanghai? And what kind of regional influences play a part in kind of creating that sound? That's an interesting question. Um, I interviewed uh, remotely uh, on a video uh, uh, for the documentary uh, jazz goers in uh, Beijing and in Shanghai. And uh, frankly, I didn't hear um, any, any difference uh, in their commentary. Uh, I think uh, uh, what I would really like to get to to answer your question uh, and that is that in the main, not only in the jazz clubs, but the, the many jazz festivals in Shanghai and Beijing and other places in, uh, in China, the audience is primarily young. You, you you're, you're the jazz audience uh, in China, it's young, as opposed to you know, me, you know, cotton top uh, in the United States and in in Europe, so that was the big one of the big surprises uh, is the jazz audience is uh, is young, and um, and apparently have enough money to be able to go to the jazz clubs, but it's it's primarily a an educated youth uh, that is looking for a change of pace from the pre the economic pressures that I had the sense that that all of them are feeling uh, in 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 China, so. In terms of, you know, clearly Beijing is the political center of China and Shanghai is the economic center of uh, uh, Shanghai. But in terms of the music, you don't hear any difference. So let me expand on, on your question a little bit more. Um, when I listen to uh, jazz musicians uh, in China and I close my eyes, they sound just like American musicians. Now, the, in the United States, there's a bit of a journalistic bias on the part of uh, some jazz journalists that say, well, only Americans know how to play jazz. Anybody outside the United States, it's, you know, it's superficial, it's, uh, you know, it's secondhand. But I've heard a harmonica player uh, in London who was from South Africa. Um, I know of, of a Moroccan uh, a singer, she just released, uh, uh, Malika Zara, who's just released another album. Um, jazz is jazz, doesn't make any difference uh, where, where, it's, uh, where it's played. I know that's a sort of a very securitist answer to your question, but uh, that's my answer. No, I think that's great. It's universal. Um, thank you for that answer. Uh, we have another one in the Q&A. Um, and this is a question from Grace. Did you find any instances of traditional Chinese instruments being used for jazz performances? Absolutely. That's a great question. And the progenitor of, uh, of that movement is a guy named Kong Hong Wei, who is uh, a jazz pianist. And he, uh, he, he actually studied classical uh, uh, music in the conservatory. Uh, and in the early 1990s, this is now post Tiananmen Square, uh, he heard um, an audio cassette uh, with Oscar Peterson playing, who was Canadian born, but is Africa, essentially uh, Canadian, African Canadian. Everybody thinks he's American, but he's actually born and raised in, uh, in uh, Canada. He, he uh, Oscar Peterson was a virtuoso uh, jazz pianist who studied uh, Chopin uh, as a as a youngster and had a, a, a phenomenal technique. Uh, in my documentary, um, I was able to juxtapose a, a clip 
of Oscar Peterson playing Sea Jam Blues, which was written by Duke Ellington, and juxtaposing that with uh, Kong Hong Wei on a piano. I actually recorded it myself in, in a club playing a chorus on a Sea Jam Blues. What, what was, and those two clips are 42 years apart. And what was amazing about uh, the, uh, the two clips is that they, the two of them were playing at the exact same tempo of this, this blues, very simple, uh, it's really just two notes, uh, G and C. And it's in the, in the, in the C major uh, uh, blues, which, which was amazing. The, the total, uh, the planets lined up for me in terms of, uh, of the documentary. Um, anyway, I, I hope that uh, answers uh, the, uh, the question. Well, at Kong Hong Wei, he has used um, several um, string instruments and one woodwind uh, instrument, it's like a small, uh, almost like a like a uh, like a piccolo. Um, and this comes out of the traditional Chinese uh, Chinese orchestra, in which there's no brass. It's all percussion, uh, strings, and woodwinds. There's no brass in the traditional Chinese orchestra. So uh, th those instruments uh, have found their way into the, the piece, the jazz pieces uh, that uh, he's written and, uh, and performed. He's the primary exa uh, example. And uh, I don't know of any others uh, that are doing, uh, are incorporating Chinese, traditional Chinese instruments into their uh, into their work, but the instruments aside, uh, there's certainly an influence of traditional Chinese folk music, which has found its way into uh, uh, jazz uh, in China, and uh, that's quite understandable because there's a very long tradition of. Um, uh, of uh, rural folk uh, music referring to uh, agriculture and nature uh, as, as especially. So uh, that's quite understandable. Hope that answers the question. We have another question from Tim. Um, this is a kind of a larger question, so I'm gonna get through it, but let me know if you need me to repeat anything. Curious, Peter Hessler in his China Driving, where he looks at the rise of car culture and ascendance with the middle class of sorts, talks about the driving test, which has many difficult technical hurdles, which have in some cases no relevance other than being hard. Correctness and adherence to rules was part of what he talked about. How do younger players interested in jazz reconcile the quote, incorrect or idiosyncratic nature of jazz and technique with a more rules bound approach? Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I get it. Um, one of the people that I interviewed uh, for the book, he's also in the, in the, the doc documentary talks about this, David Moza. He's uh, a college level professor in Beijing. Uh, speaks obviously fluid, um, fluent uh, Mandarin and is a pretty good jazz pianist as well and, uh, and a composer. He talks about this. Um, the the way he puts it is the challenge for uh, young jazz musicians or uh, young musicians aspiring to play jazz is that they've been brought up in a culture of strictness where the the master is the master and this really refers to classical music the master is the master and this is the way you play it and there's no deviation from it you know that's it so that's the road, that's the path. Don't go beyond that. Now, of course, when you introduce improvisation uh, into the mix, that's like, oh my God, you know, you're, you're playing something that's not the notes on the page. You're playing, you know, something else that comes from you, you know, from your soul deep, you know, deep down uh, here, you know, and it's a, it's a, there's a cerebral aspect of, uh, as well, of course, but you know, it comes, it comes from you, the individual, so you know, how do you reconcile that? Uh, Professor Moser uh, really says that one of the major advantages that uh, Chinese jazz players have is, is because of that classical tradition and adherence to technique, you know, having technique. Uh, I've spent myself, I'm, I'm also a musician and a composer. I compose classical 
jazz, Afro-Caribbean and Brazilian uh, music. And uh, I'm, I'm still working on hand and exercise, you know, to get the technique because that gives you the freedom to be able to improvise. And you know, if something spontaneous happens uh, in performance, you know, you've got the technique to, you, you get this instant idea and you, you reach for it and you'll be able to play it. Um, a good example um, of uh, what I've just been uh, talking about is a guy named Abu. I think he's now 22. I met him for the first time in New York when he was either 15 or 16. He has, uh, I mean, he's been playing since he was, since he was, he could walk in diapers. Um, his father uh, works for uh, an airline in, in China. Uh, he was actually introduced to Kong Hong Wei as a, as a young student. He has an incredible technique. Fantastic technique, but he also has a jazz approach, a jazz uh, mentality. Um, so he he has he has the best of both possible worlds. He recently uh, completed a bachelor's degree at Juilliard here in New York, and now he's working on a master's degree in composition uh, and performance uh, at uh, the Manus College uh, of Music. There there are three major colleges for music in New York City, Manus, um, Juilliard, uh, and uh, the Manhattan School of Music. So for other jazz musicians, you know, other musicians in China you know, wanting to study uh, jazz, you know, that that is a bit of, uh, of a, uh, a stress stress point because there's so much emphasis on, on technique and particularly in the classical world of adhering to the notes on the page and and that's it but you know it's a process it's a process you know it, it will uh it will evolve but there's no doubt that uh jazz musicians today uh, have incredible technique uh and that allows that gives them the freedom to be able to really uh stretch out i mean it's uh, a good jazz musician you know, knows how to read uh, music well, sight read very well, and has technique, and uh, you know has the freedom to be able to improvise. Hope that answers the question. We have a question from Jeffrey next. Um, is there overlap in China today in audiences for jazz and rock? Is there any presence of images of pre-1949 jazz in the nostalgia for pre-1949 Shanghai culture among various generations in China today? That's really two questions. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so those are the, fir the first question is about, is there a relationship between the audience uh, for rock and uh, jazz? Mm -hmm. Pro uh, probably, it's, it's also young people, but here's the difference. Um, the Chinese government, both at you know, what I would refer to at the federal level and at the local level, uh, look very closely uh, at rock because uh, in many instances, uh, lyrics in rock music uh, have a political edge, is one way of uh, putting it, as compared to jazz, uh, which and very infrequently uh, takes a political uh, stance. I mean, the, the most, uh, probably the best known uh, politically oriented uh, jazz piece is uh, Strange Fruit, which was recorded by Billie Holiday, I think in 1939. It, actually the lyrics and the music were written uh, many years earlier in I think 1931. And uh, if you don't know the if you don't know the piece, it refers to uh, the hanging of uh, blacks, particularly in the in the South, for whatever reason. And some, sometimes those reasons there, there were no reasons other than the fact that these um, young men were black. Uh, so that's that's the meaning of uh, of strange fruit. But in the main, as uh, one of the one of the uh, a, one of the most uh, well known singers in the uh, jazz singers in, uh, in China's guy named Coco is very good. Um, 
he points out that most jazz music is really, a, if it has lyrics, is about love. It's about you know feelings between a uh, man and a woman, um, not necessarily between a man and a woman. Uh, but uh, rock um, is looked at more a, a lot more closely. And if uh, most most a lot of jazz is uh, instrumental as opposed to having uh, lyrics. Uh, I'm trying to think to, of the name of the jazz singer out of New Orleans. His name uh, escapes me at the moment. Uh, he and this is and this is the norm. If you're a singer from outside of uh, China and you're going to do a performance, the local government has to review all of the lyrics, and those lyrics have to be translated into Mandarin, um, just to make sure that there's no anti-government or you know, uh, anti-anything uh, in those lyrics before the performance uh, can go on. And uh, Harry Connick is the, the, the singer's name. And um, he, um, I don't know if the concert was uh, was performed, but they, 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 had to, they had to change you know, some of the set, pieces in the set, uh, or whether that concert was uh, canceled. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, the audience is probably young, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't know too many people at my age showing up at, at, a, at a rock concert, uh, maybe in the United States, but uh, not in China. Um, and there are many uh, uh, all over uh, China. Uh, and the jazz audience are you know, probably the same in terms of dem a, young, a young demographic, uh, but rock, <laughs> hip hop, uh, is definitely looked at a lot more closely than uh, than jazz. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to re repeat Jeffrey's second question uh, for you. Please. Is there, is there any presence of images of pre-1949 jazz in the nostalgia for pre-1949 Shanghai culture among various generations in China today? Um. I'm not sure I can really answer that uh, question. Uh, I've I've seen all sorts of articles about uh, bringing back uh, the old Shanghai uh, jazz uh, jazz scene, and there's probably some of that. But my impression these days of uh, jazz in in China is that it's post Mao as opposed to pre Mao. Mao having take, taken over the country in 1949, October 1, and declaring the, the People's Republic of China and his uh, death in 1976. Um, and really, China didn't open up until like, like 1980, 81. So there's a few year lag there, but I think it's more contemporary. But the, um, the music, the jazz music that is being performed are clearly standards from uh, the 40s and 50s and you know, 60s and, and, and 70s. Um, the place, I'm going through my computer here, all of my memories here, the place where you will hear a pre-Mao uh, uh, you know, nostalgic uh, kind of music is the, uh, it used to be called the Peace Hotel uh, in uh, downtown Shanghai near the Bund. Um, where you, uh, it's a uh, sextet. These guys are probably in their 60s and 70s and maybe uh, 80s, and they're playing uh, the standards of the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. Um, this was actually, this was my introduction to jazz in China when I went there in 2000 as a visiting lecturer at the uh, University of Shanghai School of Film and Television since I have a background in, uh, in the media uh, as well. And in the middle of that trip, I said, is there any jazz in Shanghai? And they said, of course. And they took me to the Peace Hotel. The, um, I was very excited because I, I was thrilled actually in, in, in anticipation because I thought I was going to hear these Chinese musicians, these indigenous uh, musicians uh, performing jazz New Orleans jazz, uh, traditional jazz, and so on. And uh, these six guys come out 
and uh, they're in the 60s and their 70s, and they sit down to play, and uh, most of the chords were wrong. Uh, improvisation was uh, tepid at, uh, at best, and um, the performance, you know, but the, 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 the dance floor was filled uh, with uh, mostly Germans and, and Aussies, uh, who were mostly drunk, so they didn't care what they were really listening to. It was just it was just a beat, and that beat was uh, you know, not very strong uh, to begin with. There's actually a documentary about these guys called "As Time Goes By" in, in uh, Shanghai, which was produced by uh, a German uh, uh, director several years ago. Uh, you can you can I think you can watch it uh, online, or you can purchase the uh, uh, the DVD. But what's what makes these guys famous and why they are sort of like a, uh, you, you have to go to the, the Peace Hotel to listen to this band if you go to China, even just for you know one hour, one night, is um, that the Chinese government realized after Mao died that there was going to be an influx, particularly in Shanghai, of Westerners. So they said, well, where are all of the guys who ended up in the national symphony orchestra, uh, various orchestras, you know, where are they? And they put this, this sextet, sextet uh, together to perform essentially American uh, uh, songs from the Great American Songbook uh, as a way of making visitors from outside of China to feel culturally comfortable. Uh, these guys, by the way, they don't take vacations. They have been performing since 1980 continuously, several sets a night, seven days a week. So, I mean, my hat's off to, to these guys. Some of the personnel uh, have uh, have changed over the, uh, over the years, but uh, it's, uh, it's not great perf uh, performing uh, music. It's, it sounds old. I mean, I love these guys. I interviewed a, cu a couple of them for my book. And for the document, and for the documentary, um, but it's it's not it, it it's not it's not great. That the Peace Hotel Jazz Band that's the nostalgia, but I think the rest of jazz in China is it's post Mao. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have another question from Tim. Music and art are often a threat and a coded form of protest for authoritarian regimes. Thinking of El General helping fuel the Tunisian uprising or the Arab uh, of the Arab Spring, Spring or yeah. the recent, excuse me if I mispronounce this, Barrie made um, of Twitter posts, which has been part of the protest in Iran. Are younger artists at all targeted or threatened or cautious in their public work? Um, well, Abu, who I mentioned earlier, uh, is probably one of the young, there are a couple of other uh, musicians uh, his age or his contemporaries. Uh, I know of no instance in China anyway of these musical artists being threatened uh, by the government. In fact, there's a great saxophonist uh, who was accompanied by a Liu War, who is the so-called father of jazz, uh, he's a saxophonist in uh, China. He was accompanied to one of the uh, International Jazz Day uh, festivals, and it was supported by the Chinese government. Okay, now it's interesting that this question should be asked because a natural follow-on to the documentary that I did about jazz in China is for me to explore uh, jazz, the presence of jazz in other authoritarian countries. I've just begun that research, but uh, what I can tell you is that uh, in a very cursory, uh, I have to say, from an academic point of view, superficial uh, approach, that uh, we know that there's jazz in uh, Russia, uh, Eritrea, Belarus, I'm trying to think of the other countries uh, from uh, that we're going to be uh, looking at Turkey and Iran. There's actually a jazz scene in Iran, but that, that you know, we have just begun that research, and 
I'm probably not going to get to completing uh, that documentary. It might be a series of documentaries and probably uh, until uh, next year. Now, whether any of these jazz artists have been threatened uh, by the government, um, I, I have, uh, have no idea. I suspect that if any of these jazz musicians have participated in the protests, they are probably under uh, threat. Now, did that question, I think, was it Tim that asked this question? Was he referring to musicians and artists as in the, the fine arts, as in sculpture and in, and in painting? Uh, what was he referring to? Uh, I'm not sure. He just used the term younger artists. Uh, but he does have a follow-up question for you. Um, if you're a painter and you paint something, it's forever. So if there's protest like Guernica, uh, Picasso's Guernica uh, in, in the art, then it you know it's permanent and um so that that artist if it's in the fine arts uh could be uh under under threat uh but if it's music you know you have music and particularly if it's not recorded but it's just performed live you know it's you hear those notes and five minutes later it's gone so it's hard to say that that, that e flat that you played you know that's a political statement you know, it's, um, you, you can't pin anything on that. As a quick follow-up question to that, would you say that most jazz music is, like most jazz music in China now is, sorry, is experienced live rather than recorded or, you know, transferred through social media or the internet? Uh, that's probably true. Uh, I probably have in my inventory of stuff that I haven't uh, released on my label yet, um, very little um jazz music uh, music in china has been recorded uh, probably partly because of the expense uh i know that um maybe it's recorded on on uh, video i know kong on way has recorded several uh performances uh, several of the jazz festivals have been uh, uh recorded um but in terms of like an album you know traditional uh album as we understand it here in the united states very little shaja has several he's a jazz pianist out of uh, beijing he's the so-called cool pianist he's like uh, bill evans here in the united states um he's recorded but uh it, if you go to you know youtube or you go to uh google to look look up these guys and and women too mostly mostly singers uh, vocalists, uh, you'll, you'll find some stuff, but it's mostly, it's mostly live music. That, that's my impression. I mean, I don't, um, I don't have the impression that there's a lot of recorded stuff. I'm actually trying to get some of that stuff to put, to put on my label. I have some, but I haven't released it yet. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Tim, uh, as a follow-up to his question about music and authoritarian regimes. Ethnic minorities in China are often marginalized or oppressed, like the Uyghurs. Is there any social or musical movement being created from some of these populations? And do jazz and creative music practitioners and supporters equate their work with the legacy of Black Americans and a larger quest for freedom? Wow. Well, first, um, I have no knowledge that, well, the Uyghurs are in the Western part of uh, China and uh, the real centers of uh, jazz creation is uh, on the uh, east coast of China, particularly Beijing and Shanghai. Although there's a jazz scene in Guangzhou, which is like right, stone's throw from Hong Kong and right in the middle of the country, there's Chengdu, there's a rock scene there and a, and a jazz scene. Uh, but I have no, uh, no knowledge of uh, the plight of the Uyghurs um being converted into any kind of uh, musical uh, uh, expression again i think the re the main reason uh that jazz has survived and grown in china is that it stays away from the politics as opposed to getting involved in the politics there may there may be some rock uh rockers that are taking that situation and converting it uh, into a a statement uh, there's a 
there's a rock musician. He's the father of rock in uh, in China, Xu Jian. I maybe I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, who's been jailed a couple of times because he's he's deliberately written and performed uh, uh, pieces of music, original pieces of music that are critical of the uh, the Chinese government. He's originally a, a, a trumpet player, uh, but. Uh, you know, he, he's he's like the father of that of that of that rock scene. Um, again, the government they looks at him, they look at him, but they don't look at a guy like Abu, you know, who's who is uh, making you know China look good because of what I heard him recently play uh, here in New York. Um, and the 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 house was full. They, he's twenty two years old. He already already has a reputation. He's a great player. A good kid too. Very cool. Thank you for that answer. Um, I have another question from Hong. What happened to jazz music when it disappeared in China? Is their question. Well, uh, when uh, are you talking about the period? Uh, if we're talking about the period of Mao, which is like from 1949 to 1976. Um, Mao deliberately, uh, we have to talk about not jazz, but dance music. Uh, it took me 10 years uh, to realize that the, the subtitle of my book was uh, From Dance Hall Music to Individual Freedom of Expression. Uh, after 10 years of uh, uh, fooling around with this content, I finally realized that, that that's the arc of the history of jazz uh, in China. So we really have to talk about dance music. Uh, much of which was uh, uh, jazz, but you know, jazz standard. I mean, I, I hope everybody uh, understands that up until uh, 1945, 1946, jazz, and particularly swing music, was the, uh, the, the was America's music. It wasn't rock and roll yet. It wasn't Bill Haley and the Comets. Co uh, com uh, Comets, uh, and it wasn't Elvis Presley uh, yet. And so jazz was the music of, of, of Europe. It, was, it took about 10 years from the creation of the, the emergence of jazz as a new sound coming out of New Orleans uh, for it to reach virtually every corner of, uh, of, the, of the planet. But it was really, it was dance music. That was the primary purpose of uh, the jazz bands that were brought over from uh, all over. Um, although primarily the United States, but they came from Russia, they came from all sorts of places uh, in the 20s and the 30s and the and the, uh, the 40s. So we're talking about dance music. By 1953, Mao had succeeded in shutting down most of the dance halls in China, particularly in Beijing and Shanghai. But I, I wanna sort of, I, I think I might bring this a little bit full circle. Um, the picture on uh, the front cover of my book, John, I'm wondering if you could bring that up just for a moment. Okay, thank you for doing that. That picture, that's a picture of the front of the Paramount Dance Hall. This is a, one of the oldest dance halls uh, in, uh, in China. It was the, at one point, it was the dance hall, it, the dance hall in all of Asia, okay? By the way, that photograph <laughs> was taken by my wife with a $20 camera. And um, I also had her take a picture of me uh, on the Great Wall. And I said to her, when she took that picture, and I said, that picture of me at the Great Wall, that's going to be on the back cover of the book. That was in 2006. Pu the book didn't get published until 2018. And anyway, that is the Paramount Dance Hall. We went there. Uh, we, de we deliberately you know, used this picture because this is from Dance Hall. It, this is the, fir the first half of the evolution of jazz. Uh, in China, is that essentially is that picture? Okay, John, if I could ask you to, to take that away, thank you. Um, I read a lot about the dance hall scene in um, in China, particularly at the Paramount, and we got there on a very hot 
muggy night, I think, in, in August at about 11 o'clock in the evening. And we got ourselves taken up to the floor where the, where the dance floor was. And I was amazed to see that the scene, the, the social scene at the Paramount Hotel looked almost exactly the way it was pre now in 1949. It was the same people dancing with each other and they were there for real social uh, in, engagement. I hope that answers uh, the question. I'm probably, I go off on tangents, I, forgive me. Any other questions? Yeah, we have um, a question from Tim and kind of piggybacking on that earlier question about Chinese instruments uh, being included in jazz music. Um, Tim has the question of uh, how do the more microtonal elements influence slash find their ways into the music? And do these players find a beacon in players like Coltrane and less tempered influences? Well, uh, I can't speak to microtonal uh, music because that's really a very classical oriented um, compositional technique. Um, I have, I've never heard any jazz player or composer talk about microtonal in terms of um, being incorporated in jazz in, at all, and never mind jazz uh, in China. And what was the second part of that, of that question? One moment, let me pull it up. The second part of that, um, do jazz musicians in China maybe find a beacon in players like Coltrane and less tempered influences? Coltrane is definitely an, an influence. Um, think about the, uh, again, he's a perfect example of the influence of uh, an African-American uh, jazz musician. Uh, I'm trying to think from the documentary where he is, uh, where he is uh, mentioned, but he's definitely, oh, Coltrane was a definitely a strong influence on Lee War, uh, who uh, is, uh, according to him, too often mentioned as the father of jazz uh, in uh, China. But uh, so uh, people like uh, Buck Clayton, who was a trumpet a trumpet player, um, Teddy Weatherford, who was a stride a pianist, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, who was obviously one of the greatest scat jazz singers uh, ever and but probably forever um so i'm not quite sure i'm not quite sure how else to, to answer answer that uh, that question but anyway anyway the mention of coltrane definitely speaks to the second influence that i mentioned uh, at the beginning of this talk okay thank you for that um and then just to kind of close out with one final question um because of your expertise on the matter, are there any developments you hope uh, that happen for jazz music in China or any direction that you see it trending now that you would love to see kind of, you know, just explode? <laughs> well, I finished my book with a very, on a very optimistic uh, tone and probably overly uh, optimistic. Um, I think jazz in China has already exploded. I mean, from the time that I was there for the first time in 2000 and then 2006 to uh, the publishing of the book and, and even, even now, um, there's more jazz in China uh, than there was uh, 20 years ago. And I think that that's going to continue. Um, I think it's going to continue because despite the fact that the Communist Party um, is attempting to control more of the lives of the 1.4 billion people who uh, live there, there you know, there's a nature imbalance. Uh, there's, I think there's a, this undercurrent need, particularly from the young people, it's, you know, the young people, the ones who uh, helped Mao to, you know, 
create the People's Republic of China. It's the young people that have, feel this instinctual and innate, and because they're young, for self-expression, for individual self-expression. And that's why the young people are the, the ones who are going to the jazz clubs and supporting the jazz festivals. Um, if you were to take a look at my documentary, you would see uh, you know, stark evidence uh, of that. So I'm not quite sure that there's an explosion in, in, in the future. I think it's going to grow. It, it already has uh, grown and uh, has taken a hold. Um, I'm pretty certain that the pandemic has probably put a bit of a damper on jazz club attendance, particularly in the, in Shanghai. Uh, but that's the same all all over the world. Um, uh, anyway, I mean, my optimistic view is because jazz is a democratic form of music, is a democratic uh, uh, genre, uh, that it would have an influence on the politics, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think one of the several primary uh, aspects of life on this planet uh, is economics and pure, uh, pure and simple. And the miracle of China is that it has lifted two to 300 million people out of poverty and put them into the middle class. And they did so very wisely uh, by creating all sorts of colleges and universities almost overnight uh, in China in the last 20, 25 years. So China's a miracle. Uh, you know, uh, it used to be in terms of the GDP, it used to be the United States, Japan, and China. China has now surpassed China, uh, Japan, and within a few years, it's going to pass, uh, surpass uh, the United States uh, economically. The real issue is, uh, to try to bring this to a close, is that after people have experienced freedom by having money in their pockets to be able to buy cars, <laughs> and, and uh, condos and go on vacations and, and so on and feed their family. Um, after people have experienced that, they don't want some government knocking on their door saying, uh, 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 no, no, you can't, you, you, you can only do this, this path. I think the uh, Communist Party is attempting to deal with that and uh, my Hope is that they won't succeed. I think we're looking at another generation, probably, um, of a Communist Party rule before it evolves. That's my story. Thank you so much, Dr. Marlow. Uh, I appreciate you um, answering all of our qu uh, questions tonight from our wonderful audience. And before we close out tonight's event, uh, I'm going to give the floor over to Jim Mockford, um, president of the Northwest China Council. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Marlowe, and thank you, Mar, for hosting uh, with your uh, uh, skills to get these questions that kept coming in. By the way, there's a few more, but we will have a talk about the film, the documentary film, uh, Jazz in China, as part of our movie chat later this month, and you'll need to register for that program. I, wouldn't, I do want to thank Tim DeRoche for his many questions. Uh, he's a drummer by the way. Uh, okay. So I suppose you could have gone into the story of Whitey Smith or something from your book, but you need to tease Tim to go get that book and read it because I know you'll enjoy it. And Tim is also the program director for World Oregon, which we are co-presenting a talk on March 8th with Professor Stephen Hartnett uh, on his book, A World of Turmoil, the United States, China, and Taiwan in the Long Cold War. So you'll see that posted for registering on our website, as well as movie chat coming up. And I think for the folks that might have asked the question that didn't get answered, um, please join us for movie chat. It's through the co-producer of the film, Jay Fei Yuan, that I was introduced to Dr. Marlowe. And she was here in Portland for the Portland Film Festival showing uh, her film, Miles to Go Before She Sleeps. And of course, we were interested in that film. Uh, that's a great film to watch. But when I heard she was working with you uh, about jazz in China and our communication continued in the fall, and then your film won an award in, at the uh, 
uh, Insight Freedom Film Festival in Philadelphia. Uh, That's right. And and thank thanks for sharing a, a link that we were able to view it here because uh, I highly recommend joining us on Movie Chat Night. Uh, and when you register, for those in the audience, if you register for Movie Chat, uh, Shireen Farahi, our host, will then send you a link to watch the film that will be available of, on a, a limited basis for those who are signed up for Movie Chat. Um, so uh, we're getting close to 11 p.m. your time. Is that correct? <laughs> that, that's all right. It's way past, past my bedtime. Uh, is that okay? You, you know, some, fine. some of these jazz people do stay up late, we've heard. That's right. <laughs> um, but there are things going on here in Portland in the world of jazz. The, the Biamp Portland Jazz Festival starts tomorrow and runs to the 25th with all kinds of things going on all around town. Uh, I've got tickets to something tomorrow, but you can get something and see some of our local musicians here. And... Um, we have a fellow from Spokane on the line here, uh, uh, Steve Glavin, who runs uh, a podcast called Coffee Breaks with Steve. He's interviewing a talented young lady, Isabel Stein, on his Saturday morning show. I think I'll put that in our Facebook uh, site. So that link, I've been having trouble um, putting things in the chat line this evening, so I apologize for some technical difficulties. But we'll advertise that because I believe the young lady has also studied Chinese. I want to know more about that and some other things happening around here. Here's a uh, Suona horn that That's I right. up in China. And to my knowledge, the only person in Portland who can play a Suona horn is Mitch Imori, a very talented a musician here, who is getting married in Japan this summer. And I don't think he's coming back. So we need more Suona players. And there's one or two that do play that do play jazz suona, please let me know if you find more of those types of talents. Um, one other comment, Tim mentioned Country Driving, the book by uh, Stephen Hessler, uh, um, or Peter Hessler, excuse me, Peter Hessler wrote Country Driving. I picked him up at the airport in 2010 when he came out to give a talk about this book. So I was glad that, uh, that Tim mentioned Country Driving. That's a very interesting, um, uh, book to read and also positioned his questions rather nicely. So we look forward to more book talks, whether it's World Oregon or Northwest China Council, to bring authors who have something to say about China. And your book, I highly recommend it. I know Mara's got a copy and um, hopefully we'll get some more out here in Portland because you want to read it and then watch the film Jazz in China. Uh, John, you can turn yourself on and let me know if there's something else we need to remind people about. Uh, the chance to mention anything else you'd like to uh, before uh, we sign off here, Dr. Marlowe. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, uh, the, the great questions, and it was a pleasure uh, uh, presenting to a new audience and uh, look forward to more. Well, thank you. And thanks for uh, your, your generosity and sharing your film with us on movie night. and. Uh, for those uh, attending, this will be on YouTube. We'll post it and you can share it with your friends and uh, suggest that they read the book and also see the film, uh, which we'll talk about more later this month. So with that, I think our webmaster may uh, in fact disconnect us all. And I wanna thank you again for the, the time tonight with the Northwest China Council. Thank you.